coming up next on Two Cops, One Donut. The, the freaking worst possible time. So I get out in the middle of the street and gunfire starts to erupt. And what I don't know is that shithead, our bad guy, is sitting in the driver's seat of that van. Oh, so like, shit. He ain't in the house. Not in the house. Oh. So, so rewind back to that 13 minutes. I'm out there watching that freaking house by myself for 13 minutes. This is what you guys called me to do. I've been out here for 14 years doing this specific job, and I don't see the guy in in the van. So survivor's guilt to the hilt, to say yeah. the least. So guy sitting in the van, and if you can kind of picture, he basically he reaches out and points a gun at Dave, fires three rounds. First round goes through Dave's door, catches him in the knee. Second round goes into another patrol car across the street. Third round catches Dave's A-pillar on his door and shoots him right in the head, kills him. Oh, shit. So that's the gunfire that I hear going off. All right, welcome back to Cops One Donut. I'm your host, Eric Levine. And with me today, I have retired Phoenix PD officer, Chris Hoyer. How you doing, sir? Doing awesome, man. Thanks for the invite. Not a problem. Um, a lot of you actually may have heard of Chris. I I vaguely remember, you know, Police One, all that stuff. We hear these stories about officer-involved shootings and things like that. Um, the one that Chris was involved with was actually pretty famous um, as far as training and stuff like that from what I remember. Now I'm only going off memory and I haven't done any research to go back and cause I, I like the conversation to be natural. And if I already know the answers to my questions and it doesn't seem right. So I like asking you on the spot, but, um, sure. so we will get into that. And, uh, Chris had a 20 year career, things of that nature out in Phoenix. Um, so we'll get into that. Uh, but before we do that, how you doing today, sir? Doing awesome, man. Living the dream. Tired, living in San Diego now. So. Oh, you live in San Diego? Yeah, I know. We're like the only people in the world that moved to California, but, you know. Dang. Well, goal. to be fair, San Diego is like the the dream spot of California. Uh, it's, dude, it's awesome. I, just, I spent 50 years trying to get here and been here coming up on four, which, of course, reveals my age, but whatever. Um, but yeah. yeah, having a ball. So. Yeah, it's, um, I got a FBI friend. Um, we graduated together um for our degree and uh she she's been stationed out in san diego and she's just always bragging you know the weather's always perfect you know <laughs> they look forward to a rainy day and all that stuff yeah. plus you got ron burgundy so that is true that is true <laughs> <laughs> Go fuck yourself san diego <laughs> why oh god yeah, such a great movie i can quote movies all day which is usually a very um a uh, normal police skill for cops. I'm, we, I'm really bad about that. I I get hooked in with my friends, and that's all we do, man, all day. Sit in a patrol car, man. It's, it's pretty bad. So yeah, <laughs> nothing's changed since you retired. No, no. it's, it's, it's all the same. We just sit there, and it's you know you find one person to pick on, and then it's nothing but picking on that person, sitting <laughs> side by side, and then when you pick on them, and somebody else rolls up, and now they're the new target. So it's it's a good time. Yeah. But uh, all right, Chris. Um. So I always go down this little format. So I, what I want is I want citizens or whoever that's outside of police work, I want them to start seeing either common themes of these cops, why they became cops, or, or any first responder or judge or whatever. People basically drawn to a life of service. I think we all have two, two very similar stories. It's either we were influenced to do the job by somebody in the family and it was kind of a calling that way, or there was some traumatic event in our life uh, that that brought us to that life of service. But other than that, the other ones, the outliers, everything from there is an outlier. It doesn't happen that often. But I, I, I since doing this podcast, and I've got about 100 episodes under my belt, that seems to be the common theme, um, some, some, one of those two things. So where are you from, and uh, do you got any cops in the family? What brought, what brought you into a life of service? Well, I was actually born in uh, New Hampshire, of all places, oh, and um, when I was about 10, moved to Virginia, and then back to New Hampshire, back to Virginia, and then Arizona when I was about 21, 22, so I didn't have any uh, 
any PD family, but I later found out, uh, I'm still searching for my, my real father. He was a Marine Corps uh, recon, Vietnam, and got deployed probably right around the time my mom got pregnant. And like I said, I'm not even sure that he knows I exist. Of course, you're looking at 1969, the age of Aquarius, so God only knows. You know, so, yeah. um, but I did figure out uh, eh, not long into my career that it was in my blood, and that's, that's kind of how it was born for me, even though it was pretty much somebody else telling me, hey, you should go, you should go be a cop. I'm like, okay, yeah, sounds good. So I did. So. Okay, so growing up, you did you always know, or was it? I had no idea. I had, no. uh, I had four dream jobs. One was a fighter pilot. One was a rock drummer. One is a professional motorcycle racer and the distant fourth was being a cop and I okay. achieved, achieved one of the four. So probably the easiest one. Probably yeah. the, yeah. the other ones seem pretty hard. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so growing up, how long did you stay? You said you stayed in New Hampshire and you moved out in your twenties. I was, uh, well, my mom and I moved to Virginia when I was 10, when I was 14, she kicked me out of the house, lived with my stepdad who kicked me out of the house at 18. And then from there, I uh, stayed in Virginia for just a little bit of time. And then Arizona when I was about 22, 21, 22. So 1990, okay. 91. So. All right. Um, any run-ins if you were getting kicked out of the house? Do you have any run-ins with the cops? I, uh, well, I mean, my uh, pretty much the day I ended up, as it turned out, I didn't know it at the time. I pretty much got dropped from high school. Um, showed up late. I was supposed to go on this, on this trip with our, with our squad and got got a speeding ticket and of course i never paid it because i was that was that kid i didn't know any better right so fast forward that was when i was just 18 and um when i was 32 i was on the department for about five years they did a nationwide uh, records check and i got my license suspended while i was on the on the department my boss is like hey by the way your license just got suspended from new hampshire i'm like oh shit so of course by then i can handle it i paid it off and everything else um beyond that not really. I mean, I was, I was a pretty straight kid for the most part. So, okay. Um, I was, I was not <laughs> as a kid. I, I growing up in Flint, I was always doing stupid stuff, but luckily didn't have any run-ins, uh, bad run-ins with the law as far as me getting wrapped up. They did yeah. break my basketball hoop and stab my basketball one time. That was nice. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I Actually, you know what? I do have a story. I forgot. Um, I think it was the week I got to Arizona. I got popped for a no left turn before 9 a.m. bullshit thing. Didn't know anything about it. You know, I was okay. like, I, I thought I paid the fine. Long story short, I didn't get paid. Having a party at my house. Cops show up, shut me down. About 30 minutes later, two more guys show up. Phoenix, by the way. And so this is, you know, 91 still, give or take. Back in the day when the, the Will Work for Sex t-shirts were really popular. Okay. And, uh, I'm wearing that shirt and they fucking hook me up and I'm like, oh man, luckily I got to bond out, but I did get to ride the patrol car downtown and you know, two in the oh, morning, my God. You know, I'm, I'm sitting downtown outside the bond office with my will work for sex t-shirt on, you know, <laughs> I'm like, oh man, I thought that was, that was going to be a deciding factor to not get, get picked up by the PD and they're like, we don't give a shit about that. That's the traffic warrant. Who cares? So I'm like, yeah. that's great. What's even crazier. Were they there specifically for that warrant? Yeah, well, they originally no, it was just a loud party call. They got to. oh, okay. And of course, they they run my name. They send two more guys back to find me and my dumbass. Of course, I answered the door not knowing. Oh hey, oh shit. Yeah. yeah, here we go. Okay, that makes more sense. I was like, damn, who's doing warrant checks at two a.m. or whatever? Yeah. No, they did. They they wanted to arrest your ass to shut that party up, so they, oh, they called back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you get you get uh. You go down this this path, and you decide you decide Phoenix PD. I mean, what was the what clicked you over for Phoenix? Well, I never actually. Uh, I didn't really have any love for Arizona. Um, I followed a girl out there, of course. You know, and she, uh, she bailed a few weeks after we got there, and I was like, "Well, I'm, I'm here now." Fast forward a couple of years, I met my now ex wife, and um, fell in love. Cop with her. story. Oh you know, yeah, typical, very very common. You know. Fell in love with the kid, not as much as, as the girl. Um, took her on as my own, ended up getting married. Um, and my, at the time, girlfriend, she had no love for me wanting to join the force. In fact, I thought about it back in like 93, 94. 
And she said, no, I'm not going to, no, I don't want to be a cop wife, blah, blah, blah. And I realized, I said, you know, what I was doing, I was doing construction at the time. And I knew that I didn't want to be rolling around doing carpet work at 40 years old with freaking bad knees and bad back and all this shit. So I told her flat out, I said, look, this is a calling. It's not a career. It's a calling for me. And I got the bug during a job, as a matter of fact, a um, guy who was actually on Phoenix. Uh, I did a job for him and he's like, Hey, you're, you're a good dude. You should be a cop. Okay. So I started looking into it and <laughs> no shit. I'm like, almost a year to the day when I, when I got that, that notification, if you will, to when I graduated was almost a year to the day. So, uh, nice. but I told her, I said, Hey, this is, this is going to happen whether you like it or not. So you got a choice. You pack your shit and get out or <laughs> you, you join forces with me. And she ended up joining forces, which didn't nice. last forever. Didn't last though. Did not last, but yeah, well, but, that's as much my fault as it was hers. So the job, man, the job does, tends to do that. Um, all right. Now you do a 20 year career. Yep. The highest you made it was officer, correct? Correct. You, yep. you, you were a right life, lifetime yeah. patrolman. Okay. Yep. Um, so in that career, uh, there's all sorts of patrol jobs out there. You could be bike patrol. You could be, you know, a neighborhood patrol officer. You can do all that stuff. So did you have a specialty? Was there something that you special, you know, you liked to do in the whole time? When I had about a year on, I discovered what they call the neighborhood enforcement team, which is a proactive squad. And I had already gotten burned out on domestic violence calls and DVs. And so I set my goal to get to net. And in uh, 2002, I made it. And uh, from there, I never, except for a short stint on the, on the rifle range, uh, I never left. I stayed there the rest of my career. It was, it was awesome. Just had a blast. So explain what it is their mission is and how they operate. So basically, net squads is just what it sounds like. Neighborhood enforcement. We go out into the into the neighborhoods and we just attack whatever problems we have. So we've got for Phoenix particularly, we've got what's called the CAOs, the Community Action Officers. They take a lot of the complaint stuff, and then we on the enforcement side, we go and take care of it. Whatever happens to be like uh, as a bad example, loud parties that are continuously going on. The CAOs will get the call. They'll they'll send a, a notification to us. We'll go out there and we'll we'll handle it. Which is of course, leads to, I mean, you name it, all kinds of other crazy shit. And then we don't always get those complaints. So more often than not, we're just out on the street, just freaking 10, eight, just cruising, the, cruising the hood, doing whatever we want all day long, just chasing bad guys, getting into stuff, you know? So. Okay. Um, now for people out there listening, so that a normal patrol officer, they come in, they have roll call before they go on shift. Sergeant tells them, you know, here's the problems, here's the bolos, be on the lookout for this guy, you know, um, this particular house has been having a lot of loud music complaints, you know, goes over the day, you know, the, yesterday or the week before um, issues. And then everybody goes out and they are subject to call, meaning if somebody calls 911, they're the ones going out to those calls, they're being sent to these calls. Now, your unit was slightly different. Your unit wasn't subject to call. Generally speaking, now um, for the for the bigger stuff, you know, you got your armed robberies. Obviously, if any officer needs a backup, yeah, we're going to that kind of stuff. Um, right. Because we're still out there, and there's no way that we're not going to we're not going to support the rest of the the guys that are that are taking the the hard calls, you know. So. Right, but the idea is the what makes your position so appealing is you get to you get to cherry pick the fun calls. You get to go and just keep doing all the fun stuff versus handling, you know, the barking dog call or <laughs> handling, you know, somebody left their bike outside and it got taken, things like that. And I did, okay. believe it, man. I had a, I had a ball, probably more fun having, you know, chasing the radio than I did with uh, anything else for the most part. So now in that unit, you guys, did you utilize undercover cars ever? Or did you guys get to do any of that stuff? Yeah, I was, um, at the time we would, we'd rotate around. So I was, um, I was be like playing clothes for a week and I'd get in a patrol car for a week. Um, because of my, my tweakerish look, they put me undercover a lot. So, um, I did a lot with the like, drug enforcement and vice, um, you know, undercover buys and picking up girls and all, all that normal stuff too. Um, because also we weren't tied to the radio, we got an opportunity to train a whole lot more than the rest of the guys as well. And we didn't have one specialty. We had multiple specialties. So we were, we were tasked with all kinds of cool stuff. So, okay. Um, and for 
people that aren't in law enforcement listening, um, one of the benefits to that is like if, if a call comes out, like a hot call, um, a burglary in progress or an armed robbery, anything like that, if it's just patrol going out there, now you've got marked units coming out and they give away position. They give away a lot. Um, bad guys are so good. They can, you know, I remember him telling me, I heard the Crown Vic wind up. They knew the cops were close. And they didn't even see him yet. There were no lights and sirens, but they know the sounds of our patrol cars. So having a unit like the one that he was on, the benefit is you can get an undercover car in the area and they can start looking around before the marked units get there. And, and, and then they don't give away and they can follow off any suspects and call in the cavalry, so to speak, have the, the marked units come in. So having a UC or two or three, um, is highly beneficial. And then on top of that, if you got somebody that's in a UC and dressed undercover, now you've got even more tools um, to work with to catch these high priority, you know, potentially violent uh, people out there. So if your PD doesn't have that, it is definitely something to ask around about and to get. Now, if you're in a small, small department, you're probably not going to get those features. But if you're in a large department, Phoenix is a large department, you'll have that stuff. And, um, they, man, I, I'm in a similar unit. I'm in a property crimes unit where I've got, you know, five police officers. We dress down. We don't, we're not in a blue uniform, so to speak. Um, we do have a uniform. It's just a black t-shirt with our badge and patch, like heat pressed on there and, uh, like tan tack pants. Um, so you, at first glance, we don't look like the traditional police officer, but we're mostly in UCs. We have two guys that are always dedicated to marked units, but everybody else is in undercover cars. And it is, man, our success rate is so high. If a stolen vehicle call comes out, you know, it's in this area or whatever, the UCs get there and we find the cars pretty quickly and they have no clue that the cops are there. We don't even get out of our car. And um, so I, I tell people, I'm like, sometimes the cops are around, you don't even know they're there. Oh yeah, that's the beauty. That's the beauty of these types of units. So if you're wondering, like, how the hell do you do 20 years in in, in a unit like that? That's how you do it because you get to have all the fun and do the super squirrel stuff. It's hugely advantageous too because we've had multiple times. I know you guys probably do the same. Where we've got a rolling situation going on, and we'll just follow this guy to ground with the undercover cars, get a helicopter, and then when the guy bails out, we send in the mark units. Damn, we we pounce on the guy and it's game over. That yep. way we don't have to put the public at risk by, by chasing them with lights and sirens and all this crazy stuff, you know? Yeah, you know? And, and that's a that's a great point to make is that the, the safety of, of everybody, even the bad guy, the safety goes up because now um, we're in control of a lot more than we ever are than when we just turn the lights on and get behind somebody. We don't know where they're going to go. We, we don't have anything set up in front. We don't have, you know, if you have Air One or a helicopter or a drone or whatever, now they're trying to play catch up while you're trying to stay, you know, just at least keep the bad guy in view. So right. it sounds weird, but we actually are keeping everybody across the board safer um, in that manner. Did your computer just connect <laughs> your your other computer? Oh, did it? Oh, that's hilarious. Probably. I'm like, oh, Chris just joined back up again. <laughs> let me uh, let me shut that down really quick. Uh, there it there goes. We go. <laughs> I was like, oh, somebody's joining us. I thought it was oh, gonna be yeah, uh, so. thought it was gonna be your buddy. Yeah, <laughs> I would jump, be impressed, to be honest with you. So just jumping in, Brandon. Uh, yeah. Um okay. All right. So obviously with that job, you're going to get in a lot more shit shit storms than most people. Yeah. And uh this when you heard me talking at the beginning of the podcast, that's what we're gonna get into now. Um Chris Definitely hit a shit storm. So um, you want to set up the scenario for that call when it was and all that? Sure. Yeah, if yeah. you're law enforcement, stop and listen to me right now. If you're a police department that does not have an LPR system, Insight is offering the first 10 agencies, that means one agency apiece, gets one camera for free. You have to tell them that two cops, one donut sent you. You heard me right. If you're a police agency that does not have an LPR system yet, or does have an LPR system, and you're not happy with the product you have, Insight is offering you a free camera. 
no strings attached, and they will install it. I have 10 to give out. Tell them Two Cops, One Donut sent you, or reach out to me, and I will get you in contact. If you're a business owner or an HOA, please stop and listen to me right now. If you're just listening to the audio, do yourself a favor and watch the YouTube version of this episode to get a visual of what I'm about to tell you. I want to tell you guys about Insight LPR. It's a license plate reader. If your agency, community, or business is looking to invest in LPR to help solve and deter crime or to make your community safer, Insight LPR has my vote of confidence. I've met with their team. They know their LPRs, guys. Uh, They're the real deal. They bring over 75 years of collective experience to building LPR cameras and the software that supports communities across the country. The other thing I really like about this team is how much they listen to law enforcement. They understand the importance of working together with law enforcement and getting their input as they build and innovate products and their service to match the needs of law enforcement. In other words, when I complain or have suggestions to make their damn camera better, they actually do it. The Insight LPR team is extremely passionate and takes pride in their product development, which makes their cameras some of the most durable cameras in the market. For the gear nerds out there with that means is this stuff's made of military grade aluminum and is nitrogen purged, whatever that means. This design makes the cameras rugged and able to withstand harsh weather elements. Here's the big selling point for me. Their nighttime scan accuracy is higher than most of the leading competitors. In my opinion, this is what sets them apart. As we know, the majority of crimes occur at night, so it's critical to have high scan accuracy at night. Insights cameras check the box with the nighttime plate read accuracy greater than 96%. 96% guys, that's pretty freaking high. If your community is looking to invest in LPR technology, reach out to one of their experts today or reach out to me. Tell them two cops, one donut sent you. Um, well, that particular day was May 18th, 2016. Um, keeping in mind, I had 18 years on the force at this point and 14 years on the net squad. So I was, I was pretty well good to go. I pretty much much here. Yeah, you know, and they they didn't call me specifically, but here's my dumbass because I was res I was a resident ship magnet in three separate precincts. Uh, you can just take take that for what it's worth. So it's uh it's two thirty in the afternoon, and hot call comes out, emergency traffic, and I'm not even paying attention. I'm at the, I'm at the station. I'm impounding marijuana. I'm like okay, whatever. I, I heard the call come out. No big deal. It's about fifteen miles away. That particular day, I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt. That was my uniform for the day, plain clothes. Not undercover, but plain clothes. There is a difference. And so uh, our lieutenant gets on the radio four or five minutes into the call asking for a, a scout, basically so an undercover or a plain clothes guy to go down and check out this house. And my ears perk up and I'm like, oh, it's 2.30. I don't get off till four. I still got time to get into something. So my dumb ass, I freaking shut down the computer, grab my, my evidence, hop in the hot rod, switch over to the emergency traffic channel and I started listening for information. Get down there. It takes me about 15 minutes to get to the scene ish, if you will. Garden variety, cookie cutter neighborhood. No big deal. I get down there and I come around the corner and I'm, I'm putting out my, my location. I'm like, yeah, hey, I'm on scene. I got a, I got a van in the driveway and I went down, I went around the corner, parked about, about eight or nine houses away so I can kind of see what's going on. Um, probably not even that far. And I'm out there for 13 minutes watching the house. And you can clearly see this leading up to when I start talking about time frames and stuff. So I'm out there, I'm watching the house. And in between time, I cheated up and I got pretty much right across the street from the house. Um, about 35 yards away to the southwest of the, of the primary location. And Strangely enough, again, I've been on I've been on net 14 years. This is what I do. You know, I mean, I, I'm I'm trained to do this. I've been doing this shit for a long time. I'm really good at it, you know. And the last bit of intel that we got was basically, well, let me look back up. The call came out as a burglary. Came out as the dad saying that his son showed up at their house, kicked in the door, and stole his gun. Okay. Yeah, no big deal. You know, and we in Phoenix, very probably very much like where you are, we get these calls all the time. You know, it's not a big deal, probably three or four times that day for whatever. So I'm not complacent by any stretch of imagination, but, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm relaxed. Cool, whatever, another call, no big deal. And the last bit of intel that we got was that this, the son was at the house and he had taken a picture of himself with the, a crack pipe in his mouth and a selfie with the gun pointed to his head like this. And I'm like, How's that even work? All right, whatever. So, um, so the radio, I mean, God bless the radio dispatchers. Um, 
super heads up. She called the dad and said, hey, instead of going to the house, go down the street to the Safeway, and we'll have our patrol guys meet you down there, and obviously the marked cars. So here's Hoyer. I'm sitting on the house. I'm like, yeah, this is what I got, blah, 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 which was nothing. I'm like, all right. Very, very frustrating for me as I look back on it, thinking, man, there was no foot traffic. There was no vehicle traffic, and this is a pass-through street, and it's now you know pushing 3 o'clock in the afternoon, nothing going on. I'm like, hmm, that's kind of strange. All right, boss gets on the radio. Hey, what do you got? I got a, I got a car in a driveway and nothing else. All right, they start to rally the troops. All right, so if, if you kind of picture in your mind, I'm facing northbound and I'm looking to the north, of course. So I've got patrol cars coming southbound, and so hopefully that didn't screw my thing up here. So we get patrol cars that park that block the street to the north. We get patrol cars that block the street to the south. We get cars that are parked on the west side of the road. The house is on the east side facing westbound. <clears throat> and all this kind of makes makes sense as you kind of go through it, which is why I'm getting so specific on it. So um, the last thing that we heard from radio, because the dad had called us back and said, the son has now made it to where um, he wants to shoot out with the cops. And you're like, well, that's, that's kind of a problem. We need to, you know, we need to step it up a little bit on this one. So the very first thing we do, we, you know, call for start, call for resources. You know, I was the first one there, um, call the helicopter. They're like 15 minutes away. All right. We call the canine. They're like 20 minutes away. All right. Call for our SWAT guys. They're at the Academy training. Call us when you need us. All right. Well, that's what we're kind of what we're doing, but okay. Um, so they're at the Academy doing whatever they do down there. All right. Fine. Whatever. So we're pretty much on our own. This is a, a patrol level call with patrol level resources that we're pretty much just got to figure it out for ourselves. And even though Phoenix has got a ton of resources, we don't have a lot of the, the heavy duty equipment, like, you know, armored cars and like shields and all this kind of, you know, high speed shit. It's pretty much, all right, you know, you got your gun, your vest and your brain. That's pretty much it. Go, go to town. So, so fast forward, everybody's starting to, starting to rally. Um, Dave Glasser, as it turned out, pulls up and he makes a decision at the last second to go ahead and block in the van in the driveway, <clears throat> which has gotten some some scrutiny a couple of different ways. Um, people don't want to second guess what we did. Um, but at the same time, they're like, well, why would you do that? And Dave's thought process was, well, I don't want a rolling gunfight. If the guy has access to the van, you know, I can block in the car. We can get to our position of safety and then just do it what we call a surround and call out exactly what it sounds like we get on the pa hey cops are here come on out get your hands up blah 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 that was the plan pretty sound tactic especially with what we have you know so dave pulls up in the driveway pretty much basically his front wheels are in the driveway he's blocking in the van at a like a almost a 45 degree angle if you will and i start getting out of my car and at the time, now I've got my Kevlar helmet, got my cool shades, got to have cool shades, right? And uh, earpiece, gloves, uh, heavy vest, rifle, everything. I'm all, I'm loaded to the hill. So you look like an operator. Pretty much, yeah. I'm, I'm you know, and I know, I, I preface this with, I know I'm not a SWAT guy. I know I don't have the training those guys do, but I've got, I've got a lot of tactical background, so I know how to handle some shit. Now we'll get to that point, I'm sure, during the rest of the story. So um, get out of the car. And right when I get out to the middle of the street, what do you think happens? Murphy decides to step in. And if you guys aren't familiar with Murphy, if you want to explain that. Murphy's bit. law. If it can't go wrong, it will go wrong. Yeah, amen to that. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yep. He always likes to show up at the wrong time. The, the freaking worst possible time. So I get out in the middle of the street and gunfire starts to erupt. And what I don't know is that shithead, our bad guy, is sitting in the driver's seat of that van. Oh like, shit. He ain't in the house. Not in the house. Oh. So, so rewind back to that 13 minutes. I'm out there watching that friggin' house by myself for 13 minutes. This is what you guys called me to do. I've been out here for 14 years doing this specific job and I don't see the guy in, in the van. So survivor's guilt to the hilt to say, yeah. Least. So guy sitting in the van and if you can kind of picture, he basically, he reaches out and, Points a gun at Dave, fires three rounds. First round goes through Dave's door, catches him in the knee. Second round goes into another patrol car across the street. Third round catches Dave's A-pillar on his door and shoots him right in the head, kills him. 
Oh, shit. So that's the gunfire that I hear going off. And we've got basically 270 degree coverage around the front of the house and gunfire erupts from all different directions. My primary function at this point is cover on the south side of the house. Get out with the rifle and I'm covering on the right side of the house. I hear the gunfire going off and I'm like, oh shit, well, he's not here. He's not here. He's not here. He's got to be inside that van. So getting into the tactical side of things, about two and a half seconds before I make the decision, come up with the rifle, safety catch off, pick a spot on the car, uh, finger on the trigger, and I start delivering rounds. Um, I estimate between seven and 10 for my for my first volley of, of fire. I'm basically putting rounds downrange into the middle window of this minivan in the driveway. Now, fast forward, homicide and internal affairs, later on during the interviews, they asked me, they're like, well, what was your what was your aim point, your target? What were you shooting at? And I said, well, I knew the guy was in the van. I didn't know where. And I knew that I had one of two options. I could either put this guy down or at least create some pause for this guy. And unfortunately, um, it ended up being the latter. It wasn't the primary because I put 10 rounds down range. And what do you think happens? The guy freaking survives that shit and then starts shooting back at me. Holy shit. And you would think that you put 10 rounds of rifle down range. It should, it should solve the problem you know, and a little bit of history on me. So I'm a been a firearms instructor since 05, rifle instructor since 2011, 2012. And I've had three prior officer involved shooting one, one other with a rifle. So I kind of know what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm the best by any stretch of imagination, but I can kind of handle my own shit. And as soon as I get done firing, the one thing I teach guys on the range every single time I'm out there is don't try you know, counting your rounds when you get close and stay on target, you know, stay with that follow through. So freaking first thing I do, I get done shooting. What do you think I do? Like dumbass that I am, I drop my freaking muzzle. Uh, and then the guy starts shooting back at me. It's like, holy shit. So um, I had been in three other shootings and it's like, okay, well, the target turns, raise and fire two rounds. Now stand by and wait for the pizzas. Okay, no big deal. That was my mindset, right? I come up for that, that first volley that's the same thing. I put 10 rounds down range. That should call that should solve the problem. And then the guy starts shooting back. And now in that point two of a second, now it's a gunfight. Oh shit. You know, and I as as dumb as it sounds, I didn't know the difference. I mean, clearly we know what we understand it, but until you're in it, you don't really know. You're like, oh, what what just happened here? So I move off the X, I come back up for that second volley of rounds, and I put another somewhere between 15 or so rounds for a total of 22 into the guys now driver's side door of the car and that's what ended up finally putting him down so um that's that's kind of the initial part of the story so if you want to yeah go back and um so. so you've been involved in other officer involved shootings correct yeah okay um now this was your final one i i would imagine yes that okay. was that was the one that pretty much ended my career so okay so I would, I'm curious to pick your brain going from first officer involved shooting to your third or fourth, would you say? Uh, well, fourth was Dave. The last, the last one was Dave. So that okay. Was my fourth. So, so, okay. So from your first to your fourth and that shit still going through your mind, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, okay. to, so for officers out there listening to this, like, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you've been in one, you've been in, in 15, like shit still goes wrong and it's it's you know everybody's got a plan till they get punched in the face type of thing so like yeah so it's 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 interesting to hear you say that and it you know 20 year career speaking here from a guy who's done this specific job for quite a while and firearms instructor i mean it's important for cops to hear like you can prep all day long man and shit will still go wrong and you will still fuck up you can still mess things up and now we'll cause we're talking hindsight. So in the moment you did what you could. And you know, and and I gotta say to end my credit, man, I trained well over hundred percent. I did. I mean, I was one of those guys that, you know, I'm we're doing our quals and I'm kitted up. And guys are like, We're just doing a fucking qual. I'm like, Yeah, but I, I know being the shit magnet that I am, eventually something's gonna go wrong on the street because I'm always out there. I'm always the first one to get into the shit. I'm always, you know, stuff's landing in my lap. So I knew that it's somewhere in the back of my mind that this this has a very likely potential for this happening. So I trained 
well over a hundred. And I, I credit myself for probably performing at about 85% on the street that day. And yeah. that's still pretty far behind the curve, but it's been pretty good. So, so when you guys were getting ready to go in, um, was the, was the conversation ever had like, what if, are we doing our what ifs? All right. What if this happens? What if that happens? Or was it just like, all right, here's the plan. Let's go. Like, how were you guys mentally preparing to go up there? Well, that's, that's fascinating that you bring that up. That is how I survived my career playing the what if game since pretty much the first time, um, I got kind of confronted with a situation. I started playing that what if game and I still to this very day do that all the time. Like, you know, I walk out my front door and I'm facing a guy with a gun. What do I got to do? Oh shit. You know, whatever it is. Um, so I had, I had role played this scenario multiple times in my head, but as a team, because of where I was, I don't know what those guys talked about at the Safeway when they were, when they were dealing with the father. So I don't know what their plan was. Um, and unfortunately, because, you know, it ended up being an ambush, of course, as you can clearly hear, um, we didn't really have a contingency plan for when shit goes wrong, as far yeah. as I know. It was just pretty much acting on the fly. So Now, did you know when that first volley of gunfire went out, did you know that your partner had gone down? I had no idea. And miraculously, thank God, um, I didn't see it happen. And it was, it was, eh, I wouldn't say several minutes, but a few minutes into the scene where I started figuring out that something, something bigger has happened here. And I wasn't sure what it was. Okay. So. Um, now in, in all this going on now, there's, now there's a process. There's always a process. Anytime shooting goes down, did your, one thing that I see a lot of departments lacking in, is um after actions like proper after actions not you know some ia investigation where they're like these are the facts of what happened no 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 i'm talking like everybody gets together that was on that scene and starts to critique themselves and say this is what we did right this is where we did wrong here's how we can improve did that occur it did yeah in fact we did um we did our initial our critical incident stress debrief i think it was about a week or two later and then about a week or two after that, we did our tactical debrief, which is what you're talking about, where it's like, all right, motions at the door, thick skin, and let's just, let's freaking hash out. What did we do? Why, why did this go the way that it did? You know? Okay. Now so. with that, is there anything like, is there any details you can remember, like that you guys did well, that you guys could have improved on that was talked about there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, the tactical side, I mean, I got to say Phoenix, I'm not going to lie. Phoenix was pretty squared away with their training. Um, my understanding is they're not really still on point like they were before, which is not my problem anymore. No offense to those guys that are still there, but yeah. Um, but a lot of people don't realize also Phoenix, generally speaking, it leads the nation in Austin Ball shootings every single year um, over Chicago, over LA, over all these other violent cities, mostly because very much like where you are, it's a, it's a hub city, you know, yeah. people land from Vegas, they land from LA, they land from Mexico, they disperse out from there. And it, that's where all the violence comes from for us. Yep. And so this wasn't something new for us. We, we've been through this shit before. In fact, crazy as shit as it is, we had seven Austin Ball shootings in a six week period. Um, four of those were ambushes. Um, three officers were shot. Only one um, was killed. That was Dave. Um, and five of those seven were in the area that I worked. It's like, <laughs> so this shit. wasn't something new for us. Right. I mean, this was like, fucking wild west man it's some crazy shit so okay well that's good to hear you all got that tactical mindset um and and anybody listening if you guys aren't doing um you know after action like having debriefs um my team we have a debrief after every situation no no matter how small it is if we go to serve a, you know we know this guy's got a warrant a burglary warrant that we just wrote because we're a property crimes unit we, we set up our game plan. These are our contingencies. Somebody goes down. Here's the rescue vehicle. This is what we do. Um, this is who's going to lead the way. This is the marked unit's going to lead the way for the, you know, the rescue vehicle. You know, you guys are the emergency action team. For if somebody's got to move in, we've got officer down. Uh, we have a suspect down, whatever it is. Um, but when we're done and it goes, you know, 99% of the time, it goes exactly how we plan. We knock on the door. Hey, you got to come with us. Oh, man. Turn around, put your hands behind your back. Click, click. And we're out. That's what usually happens, and that's that's awesome. That's how we want it to go, but we still debrief it. Hey, where you know you were supposed to be set up here? Why weren't you there? Oh, I couldn't. There was a vehicle in the way. I didn't want to eat up airtime. 
because we are already moving in. All right, that makes sense. But we have that conversation. So um, I, I really, yeah, 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 and it is. And it, it gets to the point where it's just automatic. Like we, hey, Levine, next time, make sure you do this. I, you know, I was asking for this on the air. I'm sorry, man, my earpiece was having issues. I was cleaning it out. Well, next time, fucking let us know that you're doing that. Oh, yeah, right. my yeah. bad, yeah. Because that happened recently. And that's, that's where a lot of cops, they fail with that because they're like, oh, no, I'm good. Dude, I mean, because I know there was shit that I fucked up out there in that scene. And uh, the bad part about this is such a majorly critical incident that I, there's a lot of shit I can't remember, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which is another reason, another huge reason why we do the debriefs because I want to learn what did you do out there and what did you do? And, and did you see what I did? Did I, did I did this right? I did it wrong or whatever else. And, you know, I mean, not only that, of course, there's a lot of the training that comes out after the fact. Um, one specifically, I won't get into it now, but the, uh, the officer down rescue, how do you get guys in the patrol cars or wherever you're going to throw yeah. them in a pickup truck or whatever. Yep. And again, that contingency plan or that emergency plan, you know, what do you have in place? You know? Yeah. Battle lifts and stuff like that. If you, if you're not familiar how to pick up dead weight, man, it can be, can be a nightmare, especially if there's a lot of blood loss involved. Now things are slipping all over the place and, um, it like. For us, we, my, my particular UC is a, is a pickup truck. Now, one of my guys is six, eight. He's, he's a corn, corn fed boy. He, if, if he goes down, I don't care how much tactical lifting I know how to do with a person. I'm going to need a lot of help getting him up into the back of that truck and the bed of that yeah. truck. And that is something you need to be prepared for. You need to know how to do, um, shield work stuff like that you didn't have this equipment at the time but now it's kind of a at least for the major departments you know having a shield a jersey claw um you know the the piranhas or the terminators that you would set up behind that van so you don't have to necessarily have a vehicle back there um these things that you know these are all new standardized equipment that's out there and and it, it does it makes a huge difference for us we have aeds you know um talking with brandon griffith and his mission for getting those electronical heart things, AEDs. I don't know what it stands yeah, for. That's huge. Yeah. yeah. But having all those, about that all day too, so. yeah, having those things is, it's, it's a big deal. Um, yeah. but I am very, very critical about the, the after action stuff. It doesn't have to be a formal thing. It's just a sit down. One person leads. All right, here's what we had. This is what we did. This is what I saw. All right, cool. That's what the leader said. All right, now everybody explain like what you saw, what you did. All right, cool. You know, Levine, you should have been over here. Um, all right, cool. I didn't realize I was out of position. Next time, hit me up on the radio. Just adjust me. You know, yeah, I'll move. You know, my bad. And and like and you, you said, have thick skin, and don't make excuses. Those are the two big yeah. ones. Absolutely, and then most of the time, especially because uh, we generally speaking we we sometimes debrief a little bit but for a major critical incident it's always a, it's a mandatory debrief so, yeah yeah yep you know for yeah. something like this clearly we're going to go out there we're going to talk about yeah. all the shit we did right and everything not only that because we, now we've got a, a whole legal battle we've got to fight you know when the i don't know how you guys do it but we have a citizen review board that comes in and reviews our policies and what we did right and wrong and whatever else and they make the determination to whether they're going to start you know, looking at termination or prosecution or, or whatever. And it's like, because they're the most impartial group that we have, it's like, yeah, oh, so I, I get yeah. it. But yeah. We, 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 uh, I think that's kind of standard practice for all the major departments right now. Yeah. Um, we've got that. I'm all about it. Now ours doesn't have any like actual decision-making ability. They're just a recommendation. So based on what we know, this is what we're sending a recommendation up. So, um, and I think that's fair. I, I, Cops are so against change. It's just oh, our nature. And, yeah, um, <laughs> you know, if, if, it, if it keeps, you know, weeding out some of the dishonest people to get into this career field, because it happens, um, okay, I'm cool with it. It's just like body cameras. I, I was uh, one of the early adopters. I, I had bought my own. Um, yeah, I, I, Amazon it was like 60 bucks. <laughs> it sucked. It was terrible, but it was something. And, oh, uh, yeah. Cause I, I had people saying shit. Like I had, I had a, a lady like saying that I inappropriately touched her and I'm like, I need one of those body camera things. Like, yeah. and 
I didn't even know to call it a body camera at the time. I just was looking yeah. for a, a camera that you could put in your car or something. I was like, I'm, I'm oh, wearing man. that thing. Uh, I was, I was amazed. I got lucky. I never had a, a sustained complaint against me. I was like, I don't know how the hell that happened, but okay. <laughs> you know, did your job. I've, I've had, uh, <laughs> I think in the 11 years that I've been at the department I'm at, um, I've had three like real complaints and the body camera helped me on all three. So yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was just like, I, and what's funny is when you're being for people out there, don't know when you're being investigated, investigated by IA, most of the time you don't know until it's either they found something or it's, it's squashed. And then they, they don't even tell you most of the time. Um, but somebody had reached out like, Hey, um, just letting you know, we cleared up this complaint that you had. Uh, uh we want to let you know your body cam, you know, did you a lot of favors. So, uh, keep doing what you're doing. You know, they're basically telling me like, keep doing what you're doing. And I was like, which you know, is actually really good to do that. Cause that's good to hear from time to time. There's a little reminder yeah. that, Hey, you know, you're, you're doing a great job, but there's yeah. other big brothers watching somewhere. Yeah. And you're not stressed out that, you know, they're investigating. That's what I like. Right. They're like, it's right. already done. Like there's nothing you can do about it. The investigation's over with you clear. And I'm like, I'm so glad you told me after the fact, cause I don't want to know. Yeah. Like no, during either. the course of an investigation, like that's stressful because you're sitting there second guessing everything you did. Did I, did I swear? Oh, did, I, did I tell somebody to fuck off that day? Was I having a bad, I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Oh God. So well, of course, we don't have any luxury in a critical incident because we're going to, we're going to know. Oh yeah. You know, and yeah. it's going to be a big thing. And it took us, uh, it took two years for us to finally clear this one up. You know? Oh shit. Well, that's a long time. That's a long time. Of course, after. We, had, we ended up with a two rifle operators and four other handgunners out there of course we lose an officer the bad guy was killed and you know we, we put 71 rounds on this dude pretty much you know um, yeah so that's obviously a big deal i mean let's face it okay shit. so let's go into the the part that a lot of people don't get to hear about um the the afterwards so we got several things to consider here one the post-traumatic stress issues one yep. for one you fired your gun and you shot and killed somebody two Another officer was killed while you were there and a part of it. So now we've got survivor's guilt, things of that nature. You second guessing everything that you did because would have had made a difference in saving that officer. Um, these are the things they're going through. You're going to have the media coverage, which is never going to be favorable. Um, and then you got your internal. Am I going to get to keep my job, even though I did what I was trained to do, you know, or maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't do what you're trained to do. Who knows? I, I, you know, I don't know. So these, there's a lot of outside facts. And then you got legal, legal issues to worry about. Now, yeah. Am I going to go to jail for doing this? Like that's a possibility. Um, so let's go down that rabbit hole with yeah. all of that shit that you went through. The first thing I'd like to hit on was, um, internally your, your ivory tower, your chief, um, and all that stuff. Uh, your POA or FOP, whatever you want to call it. What were they telling you um, versus reality? Like, you know, sometimes, like, oh, you'll be fine. You know, Chris, we, we got you. And then you find out later they're, like, trying to throw you out under the bus or something of that nature. What was yeah. your experience like there? Well, luckily for me, uh, I did do everything right for the most part. I mean, I, I made some internal mistakes that I, you know, I questioned myself about, you know, coming off target and then, little things like not retaining my magazine when I did a mag exchange, little shit like that. But in the global bigger scene, if you will, I did everything right. And the department saw that. Um, they actually treated me very, very well. They treated me really, really good up to about a year after. Um, and it wasn't the department. It was just my, my direct supervisor that him and I started having some, having some internal issues between us which is another whole, whole long conversation. But as far as the agency goes, um, I will tell you this, the, the very initial part that um, on the scene, I'll go back to the scene a little bit. Um, I get sent out of the scene. Of course, SAU, our SWAT guys show up, they take over, they do their thing, they do the entry on the house and all this other shit. Um, homicide shows up, they do all the photos and, and all that sort of stuff. So and originally I got assigned a critical incident stress management supervisor. And his, his sole job was to keep everybody away from me. Okay, cool. You know, whatever. Um, kind of a funny story to that. I got, I always tell the story cause I do a lot of public speaking too, by the way. And, uh, I take off my helmet, put it on the, the trunk of the tailgate or the 
the Tahoe, uh, take off my vest, rifle, all that sort of shit. And I still had my, my little Glock 30 behind my back, my little undercover gun. And he's going to close the tailgate of the, of the uh, Tahoe. And I grabbed my, my Kevlar helmet and I, you know, I'm hanging onto it. And for the next several hours, that was my security blanket. I wouldn't fucking let it go. I mean, he, he tried grabbing it back from like, no, you know, yeah. and I'm hanging on to it. It was, it was the fucking weirdest thing. Why of all my equipment, that was the one I needed, you know? And I remember laying it down in the grass. I'm basically just, I'm like, I got my hand on it just to remind myself that I'm safe or whatever was going through my brain at the time. Um, but to go back to the sort of protocol for Phoenix, particularly what they used to do back in the day was <clears throat> they would take any officer that was involved in a critical incident during my first couple, it was always, you know, let's take them over to Denny's or wherever else, get them out of the scene. We'll sit them down get them some water, this kind of thing. Well, they quit doing that. And then they started putting guys in the back seats of patrol cars. And I freaking lost my shit. That happened on our scene. This is 2016. This is not that long ago. Yeah. Um, as progressive as Phoenix was, I see this going on and I fucking lost my shit. And I'm like, no. And I went to the, our fourth floor and I, I petitioned. I said, look, man, look at it this way. You got a kid that just got involved with a critical incident. And now he not only can't see his friends that all want to make sure he's okay, doesn't have access to a phone. Now you've got him in the back seat of a patrol car where who goes back there? The shitheads of our world. Probably, and it was 105 degrees that day. It was May. No air conditioning back there, you know, and you're pretty much, you've got one dude that's, me may or may not have his back to you, whatever else. He's, he's seen security for you now. You're fucking trapped back in the back seat of this patrol car by yourself. Yeah. Un absolutely unacceptable. No, we're not doing this shit anymore. So I went to the chief and I'm like, hey, you know, kind of pointing my finger at her, you know, she's like, you're absolutely right. Change the policy on that. So that was, that was a big thing right there for me. Um, luckily for me, I knew better because I found a spot in the grass <clears throat> and just sat on the grassy little hill and I'm watching all this shit going down and I'm like, no, 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 no. So um, for internal issues, of course, uh, they send you to the city psychiatrist. Um, now it used to be it just was one, you know, you do your three days, you come back to work on, on day four, whatever it was. Now <clears throat> you got to see the city psychiatrist twice and they send you to a, whatever it is you either get sent home or you get sent on another detail for 30 days, which I'm like, oh, which is a whole another long conversation. And so for me, luckily, I, I said, I'm, I'm going home. I'm not going to get sent down to headquarters. I'm not freaking moving filing cabinets. You know, I'm not going to go to some other detail where I know I'm in some investigator where I don't want to, I don't want to be a child crimes detective. And that's where they send you or wherever it happens to be. And I'm like, no, screw that. I'll stay home. Problem was, as you heard earlier, we had seven Oscar ball shootings in that six week period. So it took me seven weeks just to be able to go see the city psychiatrist for the first time. It's like, holy shit. So <clears throat> that led down a whole nother rabbit hole. So initially, I know that was a really long answer, but I hope that answered that for you. So. No, you're good. Now in, <clears throat> in with that, did the psychiatrist, did it, work, did it help? She was great. I love her still to this day. The problem was I, I walk in for the initial thing. She knows why I'm there. It's all pre-scheduled, everything else. And she's asking me those very specific questions about my, my wellness. And I'd been through this before and I didn't, I didn't try to game it. I wasn't planning on gaming it, but I knew, how, I knew how to answer the questions and I wanted to get back to the street. So I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And I go back the second time for my second interview. And that initial interview is just, Hey, you know, let's hug it out. Let's see how you're doing. How's your family, which is another thing that we need to talk about too, of course. Um, Yep. 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 Good, 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 good. You know, kind of my chest. I'm fine. Yep. It's another OIS. No big deal. You know? Okay, cool. Come back in whatever time. So I come back in like two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is. And this one is to find out, you know, now some time has passed. I've gotten that REM sleep that I so desperately need. Am I now shifting into drinking? Am I shifting into all these other, all these issues that we always have? That's why they give you that extra time in between time. Okay. I come back that second time. I walk in the door and she hands me a sealed envelope saying I'm cleared for duty before she ever asked me any questions. And I'm like, well, I knew I wasn't okay, but I wasn't going to admit that to her because if I did now I'm getting stuck on the desk, which was a huge part of the denial process for me, which was the beginning of this right here. Yeah. Me falling down the rabbit hole, if you will. And 
the, the, the whole point of that conversation was as much as I like her, she just wasn't objective about my, my true well-being. Now, fast forward, um, I highly recommend this. I did this on my own. I got all kinds of uh, um, questions about why, 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 why. Thank God you did. I went and I sought out uh, treatment on my own, um, which is kind of a funny story because most people don't know this, but if you go to any kind of other outside help psychiatry or whatever it happens to be um anytime you have a, a topic that you need to talk about like hey i'm not sleeping there's there's 12 sessions hey i'm not eating there's 12 sessions hey i'm i'm there's 12 sessions <laughs> you know whatever it is so this can go on for as long as you want it to be and if you're fortunate enough to have an agency like mine that actually pays for that which they did um i stayed with my my private psychiatrist for probably about a year after so okay which is phenomenal so okay so in that you did have, you went through some, some issues and stuff like that. Um, did you get medications? Like what, what did you do to help the healing process for yourself? You know, I, I know I'm sure a lot of guys will probably be going, yep, that was me, man. Cause I was in that stage of I'm good. Fuck you are. You're not good. You're not okay. And I was in denial straight up. Um, and this is how I explain it to people that don't understand the dynamic of, of a gunfight um in four and a half seconds during that time period dave was killed i had to kill a guy and i the rounds that he fired at me missed my head by centimeters i mean I actually heard and felt the rounds go past my head so those three traumatic events in four and a half seconds dude you're not okay and you can you can act like you are all you want but you're you're at some point in time that shit's going to come back on you and it did luckily for me um what looked like rock bottom for me was waking up at two in the morning, having anxiety attacks and not being able to breathe and running down the stairs and sitting on the couch and almost like to have the bag over my face, like <sighs> hyperventilating and trying to figure out what, what the fuck is wrong with me? You know? Yeah. Um, so luckily for me, I never, I never turned to, uh, to alcohol or anything like that. Um, even though I was in a pre-divorce, I had moved out of my house with my ex about five months before this happened, give or take. And so now I was completely alone and being at home for seven weeks, I didn't have my, what I refer to as my 40 hour family. Um, I can't lean on my wife to help me out. I can't lean on my, my friends to help me out. So I'm at home dealing with this shit all by myself, which is where my anxiety attack started for me. So. Okay. Um, so you got, you're okay with the, the department. Um, you got the help that you needed. What what was that time frame? How long did it take from the time of the incident to where you felt like you were back to a acceptable, you know, homeostasis for yourself? You know, I, I it's a it's a long story, but I have to tell you when we get to that point. If you want to hear it, uh, Washington D.C. a week almost to the day later from Dave's anniversary, um, I had a very extremely life altering um two days at the memorial wall uh, one by myself and one with the supervisor running our scene and the the day that my buddy and i kind of got into it on the wall it's a, again it's a story i'll tell when we get further down into the, into the thing i'll tell you more about it um that's when i kind of felt like man I've, I've gotten off my ledge i'm good to go and wasn't so much to be as it turned out because if you want to get into the whole thing about triggers um, I had several triggers, um, that were actually really good. I had some really good triggers, but toward the, the latter part of my career, I had one that, that set me off and just completely knocked me flat on my ass all over. It was actually two, two back to back that just completely fucked me up. I'm like, and I thought I was good. No, I was not even close. So, really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, very strange as it turned out. I mean, because there were things that you should expect and then things that you're like, how the, f no, there's no way that just happened, you know? So, yeah. How was the, uh, how was the media and stuff covering you? At oh, the time? I lost you. You're uh, you can, quit on you. Please. Can you hear me? All right, we're back. We had some technical difficulties. All of a sudden my audio just cut out. I don't know why. So I restarted. Good to go. Okay. So the part, the, the, the question I was trying to ask you, um, before we got cut off here was, um, internally everything was good um with your department uh yep. you they they gave you the resources you need um for mental health uh and stuff like that and 
Um, even when you think you're good, you're still battling things, but um, you stuck with it. Uh, and then the thing that I was getting to is the media. How was the media? Because, like I said, you got all these things going on in your head that you got to worry about. And the media is definitely not a friend when it comes to that. How were they treating you? Were they, were you even in the news? Luckily for me, I, I never made it to the news this time. Um, I had been in of course several times before, not just for shootings and whatever else, but, um, David Glasser, God rest his soul was, you know, he was that guy, right? Oh my God, everybody loved him. Um, so I think the media somehow miraculously never wanted to trample on his grave. So we never got any bad publicity on this whole thing ever, not once. So, which was kind of surprising. So, Good. although Arizona, they're, they're actually pretty supportive uh, for us for the most part in the media world. So makes sense. Yeah. Hey, yeah. You just never know sometimes. So I was just um, curious how that went for y'all. Um, uh, luckily that one went well for me and my very first one, it didn't go well. So that's another story. So. All right. So then, um, after so you got the media you're good to go that's a that's one less stressor um the other two things and then uh how about internally just with other officers well um as you well know you've been on long enough um cops are the biggest freaking they whine about shit and like you you mentioned earlier about change god forbid man it's like if i've got to drive that 06 crown vic and i want that 07 no no fucking way man i can't do that so but even worse than all that, cops have a tendency to um, start rumors about shit. And the rumor for our particular scene was that I shot Dave in the back. Oh. And another rumor was that we all, we never cleared the van and we walked by the van and Dave got shot in the back. You know, guys sitting in the driver's seat. And I'm like, look, guys, here it is. Um, I was there and I can't remember half the shit that happened. If you weren't there, don't fucking tell me what you think happened. You know, when you yeah. know some facts that we can talk and I'd be more obviously I don't mind talking about it. I mean, I've done this a hundred times. However, um, so I got a little bit of a little bit of pushback about, dude, why? What what happened? Why did you, you know, OK, well, if you want to hear this, the, the actual story, I will, I will tell you. But if you've already got your mind made up that you think I fucked this thing up, then I'm not going to waste my time with you, you know. Yeah. But mostly. um that was that was months and months later of course the initial side you know you know just the, the shock of losing another officer and dealing with the funeral and um you know coming back to work and all that kind of stuff that was that was enough of us to just deal with that alone for for the time being so um and you know you, that was probably i'm going to say probably at the like one percent mark guys are like oh you know a fucking hoyer guy whatever else you know okay but the 99 percent were a lot of hugs, a lot of tears, a lot of, you know, thank you. Thank God you're okay. This kind of stuff. So, yeah. Know. But still that's, that's some of the shit you got to deal with. It's, it's a, it's oh. another factor that people don't think of. They all think that the cops are all going to be on your side and, you know, buddy, buddy, uh, and stuff like that. But as you and I both know, like people are going to talk shit. They're going to second guess stuff that they don't, they weren't even there. They don't know. Right. And yeah. so it's, it's definitely a, a look into that that pretty quiet place that people don't talk about when it comes to these things, um, especially for public and, knowledge. Yeah, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm I was that guy for for some certain situations too. And I mean, I I would be more on the side of well, I would have done it this way. Well, yeah, you may have, but you weren't fucking there, so how do you really know? Yeah, you know. So I mean, you you can't really question what a guy or a gal does on the street uh, because your view of what happened is gonna be completely different from what they what what they saw or whatever else. So you got to take all those factors into, into accountability and realize that, you know, in that point two of a second or however long as you had to make a decision, you know, it, it may not have been what you thought it should have been or whatever else, you know? So, yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So you mentioned that you, you had two triggers. Yep. Okay. So I think it's important for, especially other officers to realize um, that, even when you think you're good, you're not. And I had, I've had several guests on here um, that have talked about their officer involved shootings and stuff like that. Um, one in particular, Bruce Anderson, uh, he's a Sergeant, same place I work. And uh, I had, I always ask 
like prior to like, are you sure you're good to talk about it and all that stuff? You get, and he's like, yeah, this happened when I was an officer. He's a sergeant now. Um, he's like, no, no, I'm good. You know, and uh, even during that, he gets triggered just talking, referring back to the story. And you can see it. You can see a total change in demeanor, his mannerisms. He starts to fidget a lot. Um, and and it, so even when he, who is on medication for it, has gone through the the counseling, you know, been to hell and back with his marriage. Luckily that worked out for him. Um, all of those things. And so here we are with yours. It's not even your first shooting. It's your fourth. And you have new issues and triggers with what you got in a position that you thought you were good to go. Yeah. So huge. Yeah. So can you Um, explain like, you don't got to tell me exactly what the trigger is, but if it, I don't want to trigger you now, but no, like, not at all. No. just curious. Uh, yeah, actually I'll tell you about four. Uh, the first two are pretty quick and the second two are, are much more uh, detailed, but I don't get, I don't have to get too far into the story, but those okay. um, first trigger, first day back on the street. Um, this is like pushing seven plus weeks later. It's a Thursday. Don't ask me why I remember that. And we're in the same getup that I was the day Dave was killed. But now I'm in a marked car, but I'm just a passenger. I say just, but um, one of my most trusted squad mates is driving. Long story short, we respond to a call to subject with a gun. And he's like, yeah, you good? I guess, well, I'm going to find out. Shit, you know, it's one of the first first calls we respond to. And uh, when we get out there, I see Joe, the sergeant that was running the scene. And then I see Brandon was the guy that helped me uh, as a backup officer during my during my little freaking melee when I was running around the scene. And then I see um, one of the other guys that was there and then another guy that was there. And so the short of it is basically I've seen everybody that was on our scene with Dave, obviously, except for Dave, huge trigger, fucking set me off, major anxiety attack. I freaking make a beeline back to the car. The scene is secure now. Make a beeline back to the car. My buddy, luckily, was heads up, spotted that. He's like, hey, man, you good? And what it, what I learned from that experience, which is the whole point of this part of the conversation, was I learned that. Yes, it was a trigger, but it was a good trigger that made me recognize that, you know, even though it was the same scene I was on before, I left there safely. Even though it was an uncontrolled environment, I still left there in one piece. And that was a huge thing that pushed me in the right direction. Holy shit. Fast forward a um, couple of weeks or so later, I'm working off duty um, at a bar. And I don't normally do I sit very much, but this particular night, I happened to be sitting on the tailgate and my truck was down. And, uh, the bar right behind us, guy pulls out in the street, cranks off 10 rounds out of whatever car he's driving. The first thing I do is I jump off the tailgate and I run to the street and I look down to see what this guy drive, he's driving off to. And it dawned on me, that was another huge trigger that I that hit me that I still have the ability to round, run to the sound of the gunfire. A huge push forward for me as well. I'm like, I still got it. Yes, you know, I was so excited about that. Yeah. Fast forward, um, February 2018. Now this is two years later almost. And hot call comes up, emergency traffic comes up, officer involved shooting. And right away, my freaking, because that was the first, what we call 1033, I'm sure you guys have the same. Um, any kind of a major thing that goes on, we put out what they call 1033, which is like, drop what you're doing to get your ass over there kind of a thing. So I hear this come out, and I'm like, heart's pounding. Oh, shit. And again, going back to being a resident shit magnet, this is like five miles from the scene about three miles into where I start heading that direction, I find the bad guy's car. I'm like, mm. fuck, 825 extra. I got that vehicle heading northbound. Sure as shit. Long, long, long story short, I made multiple mistakes during that. And I was playing clothes that day. The short of it was basically I had an at-fault accident um, doing stupid shit. I'm going into parking lots and I know don't go through trying to, trying to cut through traffic. I know it doesn't go through. I tried it anyways. All kinds of mistakes that I made. But the trigger was hearing that radio tone come out of an officer ball shooting. Luckily, that didn't end up being a big thing. Um, the kid survived it. The officer survived it. It was all good to go. Um, but that set me in the wrong direction because I'm like, holy shit. I haven't responded to any major radio traffic since since Dave. You know, and I made pretty much every mistake you can make. I mean, it was like fucking first day, you know, <laughs> out of the academy and not knowing what, the, what I was doing. Yeah. You know? And now pushing, of course, I've got 19 years on now. And actually, close to twenty. I'm, I'm getting ready to my my twenty is even in April, so this is February. Matter of fact, April seventeenth, twenty eighteen. Um, 
call comes out. I'm, I'm hooking up with my best friend on the department, the canine handler. Um, he's like, man, I got to go take this, this thing. It's a big chase. You know, one of those ones you see that goes all around the city all day long, whatever thing. Fast forward on that one. I get a call later on that he, um, they sent his dog in and the dog never came out because he was killed on that scene. Oh, and on my 20th anniversary, my best friend. So I fucking lost my shit. I did. That was probably, probably the worst trigger I ever had that just set me spiraling out of control to the point of I drive, I'm like driving back to the station. I'm like crying, like bawling my fucking eyes out. I'm like, Oh my God. And I get back to the station, um, throw all my gear in the truck and I go to my desk. I clean up my locker. I clean up my desk. I tell my boss as I'm walking out the door, I said, I'm fucking done with this shit. And I walked out. Oh shit. That's a problem. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that was, that ended up being the, uh, probably one of the biggest mistakes I ever made on the department, you know? Um, and it it just, that's, that's the last thing you want to remember on your 20th anniversary is your best friend losing his dog. It's like, holy shit. So that one, that one sent me spiraling. So, so how did you bounce back? What was, uh, I, um, I took the next three days off that happened on a Monday. We worked uh, Monday through Thursday. Um, basically told my boss, you know, cause we worked on, on a specialty squad. So we weren't manpower allocated. So long, long, long story short, basically I got jammed up for a, a misuse of leave time, even though for policy I was covered, but per the MOU, um, which is like the supervisor's policy for folks who don't know. Um, he jammed me up for that. And I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? So, um, that sent me spiraling even more, um, fast forward. Uh, I got, I got to mention this part too, because <clears throat> we had just gotten all of our medals for this whole thing, which is another long story too. And I'm like, wait a second, I'm getting a medal of valor and he, and Dave was killed. What is, how does that work? You know, I, I still haven't wrapped my brain around that, but that's a conversation for another time. But, um so with my boss he writes me up and i ultimately get sent to the front desk to work and i'm like okay i can kind of see because I, I was i was mentally unfit at this point i was i was a fucking disaster um and the absolute lowest part of my life personally and professionally on on the department was i'm not allowed to do anything i can't go because i was an instructor for the for the precinct i can't go on the range and shoot I can't take a patrol car out. I can't take an undercover car out. If I want to leave to go get lunch, I got to take my POV, my personal vehicle. Okay. And because I'm not allowed to do anything and I don't really have any work because I'm not a detective, I don't do any, all that sort of shit. And we don't, we're not part of that anyways. My job right after my 20th anniversary was scraping the fucking barbecue grill on the precinct. Damn. Wait a second. I have been in four shootings. I buried at the time 16 of my buddies in the line of duty. I've gotten medals of life saving, medal of merit, medal of valor, all this shit. And, and this is my fucking job, you know? And dude, I was like falling apart. However, um, started to rally, got my shit back together, um, went back for the meeting with the commander. Commander's like, what the fuck, you know? And I'm going, hey, this is kind of where I'm at. And his words were what basically pushed me back to where I needed to be. He goes, Chris. He goes, you're a kick-ass cop. You've been through hell. He goes, you know your shit. He goes, next time anything is going wrong in your life, he goes, just handle it better. He goes, just come to me directly and just handle it better. He goes, now get your shit together, get back on the street and fucking prove that you're a good cop. And I'm like, fuck. And that was the deciding factor. Man, feeling 10 feet tall again. I'm like, yeah. Got back out there. Um, Was back on the street for about eh, pushing two months, maybe something like that. and I, I proved to myself that I could be back out there. And by this time, um, I know I keep going back to all these other old stories. <clears throat> I got sent to the rifle range for about seven months. And during that time frame, I was basically there just to be off the street. The day I found out I was going back to back to patrol, if you will, back to the net squad, I triple failed the rifle qual. I'm like, wait a second. I'm a fucking rifle instructor. I teach this shit all day long. And I failed it on day one, came back, failed it again on day one, 24 hours later, come back, failed it again for day two, but now the third time. So basically I got my rifle pulled. I'm like, fuck. Damn. So I had to go back to that 10 hour rifle research class that I usually taught 
and yeah. now I'm a student. <laughs> and the guys are like, "Hey, you teaching a class?" I'm like, "No, I'm fucking, I'm a student." <laughs> you know, you fucking dumbass. But the, I mean, jokingly, that was how it was. But in, in all seriousness, I was so friggin' screwed up from knowing that I had to go back to the street that I, I couldn't handle it. And I, my concentration was so bad. Um, <clears throat> looking at the time, my, my youngest, my 16 year old looking in his eyes and he's like, you're a fucking mess. You've got no business back on the street. And I'm like, no, you're right. But I have a choice. It's either I go back to the street or I sign light duty paperwork saying I'm not fit. And if I sign that I'm, I'm done in the law enforcement community, you know, and I, I knew that. So I went back to the street. Um, in between, that's when uh, Curtis lost his dog. That's when I had my other trigger, all this other kind of shit going on. Um, but then fast forward, right before I retired, um, got my act together, got back out there, made enough contacts with people back on the street that I realized, I'm like, yeah, I've got what it takes. And then when you, when you get to this, I'll, I'll tell you the story as to physically why I actually retired was because of another trigger. So. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you're, you're really close to the end of your career at this point. And I know you've authored a book since then. It's all, it's all about, is it all about the incident in itself? That's, that's the general consensus on it. Um, it, it kind of starts there and just kind of filters out to a lot of the other shit that happened, but it's not just about that. I've got a lot of other funny cop stories and okay. a bit of autobiography and shit, but generally, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I was I was curious if uh, out of that, like, had you realized at the time that you were going to make a book or anything like that? Well, I actually started, uh, and just for the for the audience and for you as well, I highly, highly recommend because we're always told, yeah, I write a story every day of something you did, which fucking whoever does, right? I never did. Nobody I've ever, no one ever has. Um, so I didn't have my, you know, accumulation of stories for my 20 years. Yeah. It was uh, it was around September of 2017. I woke up one morning and just got on the laptop and started just freaking writing. I have no idea why. I just decided I'm just going to start writing the, writing my memoirs. That's pretty much how I looked at it at the time. And, um, dude, I swear to God, the, the thing fucking wrote itself. I could not keep up with the keys. I type fairly well. I mean, I'm, I'm more of a peck typer, but I can type pretty fast. I could not keep up with my fingers versus my brain, you know? Yeah. Before I knew it, I had over a thousand pages and <clears throat> fast forward my girlfriend now who did all the editing for me. She's heard me speak multiple times, met a lot of the guys that I that I've known on the department. She tells them all the same thing that that book's actually saved my life. I'm like, Holy shit. Okay. So that combined with the public speaking, getting out and just talking about it and seeing a guy's eye shift to go, yeah, I kind of know where you're at and I, I kind of need that guidance as well. That's, that's my whole goal now just to save other guys and girls. So, okay. So you, so you started this project prior to retiring. Correct. Yes. Okay. And, um, all right. So I'm trying to, trying to hit the end of the story as far as all the things that you went through with your OIS, but then start snowballing the the back side of the story with you public speaking with you writing a book um and where you're at now through the end of, when you finally decided to retire so let's let's go with that what you know what made you finally say it's time to get out and then how did you get into the book and the public speaking and this all episode that? of the podcast is brought to you by impact tactical impact is a tactical outfitter for the men and women of our military police fire departments and other public safety around the country impacts core beliefs is that fearless men and women protect our freedom and safety should have access to the best tactical performance apparel equipment and tools on the market and they shouldn't have to go broke to get it. I've used Impact for about 11 years, and I can attest that they do live up to their core values. So you get a personal recommendation from me. You can find them at impacttactical.com. That's M-P-A-K tactical.com. And be sure to tell them that two cops, one donut sent you. Got it. Okay. So it was June 2018, right? So I'm past my 20. I got, you know, I'm, I'm well, I mean, I've, gone into the drop program, the deferred retirement option plan, whatever else. And, um, had I stayed for the full five years, which is what we're allocated, I could have made a shit ton of money. Um, 
but I knew also that San Diego was where I wanted to go. And now I'm, you know, five years almost, right? Whatever it was, no, three years uh, separated from my, my wife. So I knew the divorce was inevitable. It was a matter of time. Um, and because I knew I wasn't really done in the law enforcement community, I wanted to stay with it, which is partially why I got into the public speaking thing. So I thought, well, I'd be some good connections and so forth. And um, so June 2018, we responded to a hot call, another emergency traffic call. And we get out there and um, basically what it is is a uh, husband calls because the wife has called him saying that she's being held at gunpoint in a car with another person by some unknown person, whatever it is. Oh, shit. Okay. Another typical Phoenix PD freaking story, you know, no big deal. Um, and keep in mind, of course, I don't have my rifle. So all I got is my 45. And I'm like, all right, well, all right, this is what I got. It's what I got. So fast forward, um, we uh, grab a team of guys and we're walking down this really long alley. It's about 75 yards and it's basically covered with green tarps on both sides, chain link fence kind of a thing. And as it turned out, I took the lead just because that's how the configuration worked out. <clears throat> So I'm on the left-hand side and I'm walking down this fence line and on the right, we can start hearing this guy screaming, you know, and all this commotion going on or whatever else. We don't really know what we have. And of course we got radios down. We're just doing hand signals, you know, all this kind of shit as we're walking up. And as I around the corner to the right, I see a guy um, and he's literally holding a gun inside, basically just inside of a card, but I can see that his finger is on the trigger. Okay. So, I come around and I let everybody kind of set up around me and the guys that worked around me knew that how I operated was, dude, you, you designate one negotiator and that's it. You don't have fucking eight guys screaming at this guy because he's not going to be able to hear what you're saying. Right. So we pre-planned that, which is one of those things where we talked about before we started. <clears throat> All right. Whoever makes contact first, you're going to be the negotiator or whatever else. It turned out it was me. Um, started negotiating with a guy, Hey, you know, Phoenix PD, dropped a gun and this is what I see. I don't know if people are going to be able to see this or not, but um, this is what it looks like. He's holding a gun here. He looks over at me like this, turns back and then he lowers a gun and it's about that long. And I'm, my fucking heart is pounding. I'm like, Oh shit. Um, I picked a spot on the side of his head. You know, I'm about 13 yards or so, give or take. I paste it off later and well, 13 yards, I'm still pretty good with the handgun for the most part. Um, anything beyond that, forget, I can't even hit the broad side of the barn, but whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to put one right through this guy's, through his triangle. He's going to be done. Um, but of course, he's got the finger on the trigger, which is a big deal. Because I'm like, man, if I fire on this guy, he's going to freaking, he's going to have an unintentional discharge. He's going to freaking kill these, just at least one of these people in this car, probably. So, um Luckily, he just lowers the gun, and then he lays on the ground, and he just gives up. I'm like, thank God. Here's the deciding factor when I retired. And I always, when I do my public speaking, I tell the story. I ask the question, do you have any idea what it is that made me call it quits that day? I'll ask you that question. Uh, you were going to hesitate to pull the trigger? Nope. Okay, then I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it is a trick question. It is. Because that's not something you never think about. You're like, why the fuck? Three other shootings, now a gunfight, been an instructor since, since the fucking dawn of time, pretty much, when I almost, when I got on. I'm holding this guy at gunpoint, completely slacked out on the trigger, all the way out, as far as it can go. And I go to holster my gun with my finger still on the trigger. Oh, shit. I realized that, that very second I was no longer fit for duty. I literally dropped paper the next day and then retired. So really? I'm like, if, if I'm so fucking screwed up that I can't remember take my finger off the trigger I, i'm just not I, I have no business here you know so that's when i called the quits wow <clears throat> okay yeah um have you i in this i told you to go down rabbit holes this is random have you ever shot a pistol with a red dot sight on it i have been I, in fact i'm going out to phoenix next month and i because i do a lot of teaching on the side here in san diego um, I have never gone through the red dot class, but I desperately want to, cause I need to know how to do it so I can teach oh other God. guys. It's so amazing. I'm not, a good, I'm not a good pistol shot. Like I, I, I fully admit that my boys are shooting, you know, 96 to 99s, you know, that's their, their average. And I'm here. I'm at like 
93 to 96, maybe, yeah. give or take. Um, never shot 100. Um, yeah. I shot with that red dot, and I, w- I didn't miss. I was punching holes in it. Nice. From nice. from you know, I think we sh- the farthest we shoot out is twenty five yards, yep, which is though. which is usually where I fall apart. Like that fifteen, we do fifteen, and then we do twenty five, and yeah. fifteen I usually have a lot of misses, and twenty five I have a lot of misses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm with saying. that red dot, there's no missing. The thing oh, is, as long as your fundamentals are solid, which I have always had pretty good fundamentals. It's just I I shoot for speed versus sh- like trying to make sure i'm always like everything's perfectly lined up and i'm i, I shoot fast that's that's gunfighting that's not target accuracy though it, yeah, yeah yeah and that and that's just how i shoot i try to shoot very instinctual it's hard to shoot instinctual from 15 25 yards it is right um, but, but that's like, that's reality that's yeah. reality with training right there though you know so. yes and that's yeah. that's cause the way i've always looked at it so yeah maybe i could shoot you know 98, 99s, 100s, if I really hammer down and focus. and But, it, but that's, that's not it's not how I would ever get in a real gun. For, at least I don't think I've never been in a gunfight. You know, not exactly right. But, You're not going to uh, have time anyway. You're not going to have time to fucking go. You know, that's why, right. you know, we say you train at 100 to, to perform at 70, you know, so. Yep. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, that red dot, you, I, when you said, you know, at, 10, 15 yards or 13 yards. So you were, you know, you start to degrade a little bit. I was like, man, get that red dot sight. It will change your mind. I, I got every, of course, I don't have the freaking money to go buy another one now because I got all this other shit going on. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I definitely got to get one. So I use yeah. the, um, I think it's called the SRO by Trigicon. It's like That's a round, right. it's like a round one, like not okay. that square. Um, I think. Most of my guys carry the square one, whatever that is. And yeah, I, I like that. I like the round one better, personally. Just a much easier sight picture. You don't have to like shrug your shoulders and really get down yeah. into it. Yeah. Um, because I do have one on the. It's hard to see the gun back here where my finger is trying to point in between the helmets. Um, that has a red dot sight on it, but it's more of a showpiece type thing yeah, than yeah. it ever really gets shot. Um, it was my grandpa's pistol and i turned it into like a star wars gun oh nice <laughs> to to because it was a 40 cal glock and i don't like 40s and i, I didn't want it to just never be used or right, right. you know so yeah. i turned it i turned it into that and uh that works. Cool. yeah yeah now it's not it's all <clears throat> glamored up but um yeah. that's got that i shot that a few times never been trained with it but i i didn't care for that but then when i shot that other one the round one the SRO, like I think, I think that's what it's called. Yeah. Man, I was I felt like I was cheating. I know, right? That's yeah. how I felt about the rifle. The fucking rifle, man. That thing was just it was just not even fair. I'm like, holy shit, man. This is great. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I love it. But um all right, we'll get back on track. I'm sorry. So not worried, man. So you 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 have that call, you drop your paperwork. Um I take it nobody gave you any shit for dropping your paperwork. No, no, they were probably happy to see me go because they're like, "All right, man, you've you've done enough shit. You know, we don't need you out here anymore. You're stirring up more trouble for us." So yeah, especially being in that unit for as long as you were. <clears throat> I mean, just the amount of accumulated stress and trauma and stuff that you've seen over the years, man, it probably was about time. You know, it took it. It took its toll. Yeah, and I, I really people ask me pretty much every time I put on a presentation, you know, do you miss it? And like, no, I really don't. You know, yeah. um, I do miss, I know you'll definitely appreciate this. I do miss gearing up for the raids. You know, yeah. that was a lot of fun, you know, uh, yeah. and I do miss hanging out with the guys in the lunchroom and shit like that. But as far as the work goes, I'm like, nah, I, yeah. I can't really do what I do, you know? So yeah. The minute you see one of those, uh, you know, viral videos of someone putting their cell phone up in the police officer's face and stuff like that, I bet you're like, yeah, I don't miss that. One of my biggest pet peeves of all time, man. I've I've thrown yeah. more fucking phones across parking lots, man. <laughs> that fucking phone yeah. on my can't do that shit today, man. No, no you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, what transitioned you into public speaking and all that? Were you uh? I mean, you <clears throat> seem to have no problem talking on here, but was that your thing even back in the day? Were you known as being a talker or anything? Not, not really. Um, I was. Uh, I was really popular with my antics on the street, um, but I was just really kind of a quiet guy, you know, and I was, I was more on the side of, 
<clears throat> I don't want to hang around the briefing room and talk shit. I want to go out there on the street and fucking work, you know? So, um, but there was, there were very few situations that I really felt like I couldn't handle, you know, uh, you mentioned yeah. control early, early on. And I realized that, um, as much control as I thought we had, you know, it really wasn't, I mean, control bad guy, control pursuit, control gunfight, all this kind of shit, you know, it's like, okay, well, control is an illusion as far as I'm concerned. Um, but uh, I could control my my own emotions, which is pretty much where um, I kind of felt like, man, I can I can go in and talk to these I call them kids, you know, talk to the recruits and say, hey, look, um, this actually happened. And sometimes I got to remind myself that this this actually fucking happened to me. I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I look back at the photos. I got the whole thing on, you know, got the crime scene photos and everything else, and the, the audio and the 911 call and all this shit. Um, and I had forgotten, you know, the importance of what I was doing. And so when I made the decision to start speaking, I, it's, the very first one I ever did was actually at the Academy. Um, and it was uh, actually a post post class. These guys had already graduated. Now they're going back for the post class. And, uh, <clears throat> I said, Hey, these are the dynamics that led up to and how I, how I dealt with and everything else. And it wasn't a very long one. And then that progressed into, I actually took three days off to spend time getting all the legal paperwork that I needed to do my presentation because I got pictures of the Phoenix Police Department stuff in there, which I had to have a liability waiver statement, you know, created and all this other stupid shit and like whatever. Um, because I realized that as as much as I hate saying it out loud, I I, I don't even I try I got to come up with a better better uh, like sales pitch for this, but. Um, there are there are not that many guys that have had the level of experience that I've had, and the guys that do don't want to talk about it, and the guys that do want to talk about it don't want to talk about it in a public public setting. So I try to do everything I can to not sound like I'm arrogant about that. I'm like, dude, I, I'm an absolute 100% regular dude that just survives from incredible you know circumstances, but because I did, um, I have this obligation. I've got to I've got to help other other folks out and let them know. Um, you can be a kick-ass fucking net guy, SWAT guy, canine, whatever else, and you can still get your ass, and you will get it handed to you at some point in time. So just because you're out there and you're 10 feet tall and you got a fucking rifle like I did and sending selfies to my mom and all this great shit, you know, it's like, mm, I, I saw one picture of the dead guy, and I'm like, this is a reality of what you might be facing. It may not be a gunfight. It may be a child drowning. It could be a car accident. It could be any one of these critical incidents that could set you off, you know, so. Yeah. Um now it obviously public speaking, um, doing what you're doing, hopefully, you know, the, the whole goal is just help one recruit, help one officer out there. It's kind of the premise behind the podcast, help one citizen understand a perspective, help one cop understand a perspective from the community standpoint. You know, there's, there's all these things, but you, you hope you just help one person. And, um, I think I've accomplished that. Uh, I know I have, I've actually had you know, some good testimonies from people. Um, I'm sure you've got the same thing. It's a good driving factor. You're still serving in a way, um, which is, you know, it's still part of the job. Started yeah. having the badge and even though you, you hung it up, it's still there in spirit. Um, I think, I think that goes for just about every cop I know that's retired. Um, well, but I gotta tell you, it's, it's one of the greatest things cause I get to be in the law enforcement community, but I'm not getting shot at. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but with that said, how, how is your public speaking? We know how you're helping the cops. This is shit they got to face. It could happen to them one day. Um, kind of like your book cover says when, when that day comes, I mean, it's very fitting. Um, uh, it'd be a good t-shirt. You got t-shirts. I had Natalie, my girlfriend made one and I haven't yeah. worn it yet. Cause it's, it's kind of weird. I'm like, that'd be a good, that'd be a good t-shirt. Um, but are you speaking to the communities? Are you talking to the public? Are you, are you giving them this, what I would consider an insider knowledge? I haven't really yet. I've done, um, obviously mostly PD stuff. Um, I have spoken to Signum mental health, um, a couple of times and that's pretty much as far out as I branched because, um, Truth be told, it's, it's kind of hard to break into that market, you know, because yeah, very specifically, a lot of stuff I talk about is, I mean, don't get me wrong. 
Um, I've, I've toned it back a lot because I was talking a lot about the tactical side of things. Now it's more on the, the wellness and resiliency side of things. So yeah, um, it's, it's kind of hard for, especially here in what I call California, you know, people, San Diego is actually really, really good. Um, but it's still a very tough market to break into to, to educate the local public when they see the shit that I show. They're like, what the, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd love to do that. If that opportunity presents itself, I would absolutely be all over that 100%. Yeah. No question of that. And I've, I've got the, the presentation tailored. Like I'm doing one for the San Francisco Chiefs of Police organization here next month. I think it is, whatever it is. So I got to tailor it for that and then I can tailor it for patrol and I can tailor it for whatever else. So yeah, it's, it's constantly evolving. I think it's important um, to try to do anyway to, and this is the angle that I would, that I'm thinking of when I think of this stuff is the public puts so much trust, so much money into just one cop and we're an investment. Oh yeah. And you want to invest in, in, in the good ones. You know, filter out the bad, you know, uh, work on the ones that need the works, things like that nature. But if you want to invest and, and make and take care of your investment and keep those good cops out on the street, um, I'm not saying you're a good cop. I'm just, <laughs> uh, you want to. Keep those, yeah. Uh, if you want to keep those good cops on the street, this is the stuff they need to understand and invest in. Now, you work for a department that took care of you both mentally and physically like that's awesome there's a lot of departments that don't do that that's true that you're you're damaged goods and they look at you as damaged goods um i just had brandon on uh an officer that had virtually dropped dead uh it's really what happened he dropped dead um had some rare heart thing happen to him which is it's not uh it's not a what do you call it? Hereditary thing. It's not a genetic thing. It just, it could happen to anybody. What happened to him? Um, just, he hit the lottery for that one. Uh, and now he's fine. Technically, you know, medically speaking, he's fine, but no, mentally, the, well, you know. yeah, mentally, maybe not, but the way everybody treated him after the fact was like, he was oh, damaged yeah. goods. Absolutely. Yeah. And even his own department. So that is something that we need to start considering. If we are going to grow together with our community, is having guys like you speak, tell your story, talk about, like you said, maybe it, it, tailor it. Maybe they don't need to know about the tactical side. Maybe they don't even give a shit. Why do they care? But they definitely need to understand the importance of taking care of the mental health side because you were out in the streets. You were not mentally ready yet, and you could have been one motherfucker away. You could have been one use of force away. You could have been all of these things. Just that trigger hits because the mental health side still wasn't a hundred percent on top of its game. In addition to that, just to piggyback on what you're saying also, because people, when you call the cops, they show up to you at your door. You don't know what kind of day this dude's having. He right. might just be having a bad day. He, his last call may have been, he just pulled that baby out of a green pool. But because like you said, his department's not taking care of him. Well, you got fucking got another call. Go, you know? Yeah. So he's got that on his mind. Now he's got to deal with this piddly bullshit call over here. Yep. And you may, as a citizen, may be thinking, I'm not getting the full, you know, the full service that I'm, that I expect from this guy. But if you don't understand why he is the way he is, and this is where a lot of cops get jammed up, myself included, because I say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time. It's not because they're bad dudes. They're just having a, a fucking bad day. Some people just don't realize that, hey, man, you can't. And this is how I, I describe it the best. You can't see the shit that we see and expect to be okay. It's yeah. just organically not possible, you know, and I kind of go into it on the book. I talk about this a lot where, you know, um, you know, my daughter just crashed her car and, you know, my wife is pissed off because the bills aren't being paid or, you know, I just got into a screaming match with my boss or whatever it is, you know, and now I've got all this other shit compounding over here and now I've got to deal with your problem and now you're screaming at me over here and it's like, Right. Yeah. Where's where's my breaking point? You know, and unfortunately, yeah. a lot of times it happens to be the citizen that says the wrong thing to us, and we get set off. And I'm like, fuck, and that's not our ever our goal. Yep. But we're we're regular folks. You know, I mean, okay, yeah, I get mm -hmm. it. We we've been trained to a higher standard, and we we understand a lot more than you know than a lot of people give us credit for. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it's like, look, 
shit goes wrong sometimes. You got to recognize that. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm on board with, uh, I, I think, I think that that could be a next, uh, venture of yours. I, I, I don't know how to dive into that, that media. I don't know how to, how do you set up a meeting with, with public, you know what I yeah. mean? But you could be a guest speaker at a town hall meeting or whatever with the neighborhood patrol officer. Or, uh, what was yours called? Our, ours, the, the liaison between the community and the patrol officers, ours was called an NPO. But, yeah, we had we had that. We changed that acronym. Our Phoenix changed their acronyms every other freaking day. Yeah, uh, our, the CAOs. The community CAOs. Acronyms. Okay, and I knew you called it something. I couldn't remember what it was, but yeah. So same thing. Um, but that could be that could be a cool avenue. Um, to I love that absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm welcoming for that. And I, the joke is that I'll talk to anybody that's willing to listen to me. Pretty much, you know. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's basically how why this podcast survives. Um, yeah, there, yeah. people just go. keep listening to me. I don't know why. Because uh, I, I I mostly do it for myself. I love having the conversations, and I have I think in the last two years of doing this, my knowledge as a cop has you know exponentially expanded oh, in that short period of time. It, all this knowledge that I've gained from talking to people on here has it put me ten years ahead of my career. Oh, you well, know, no, as far as. And- Obviously, you're making a huge impact on on the community as well. So I just I love what you're doing. Um, Hopefully, I got it. I got to love the freaking title too, man, because I know where that came from. <laughs> no, you don't. You For think guys. you do? All oh, right, okay. think you do? Yeah. Okay. So two girls, one cup. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to tell you how naive I am, um, which yeah. I grew up in that area. I was active duty military when that came out, okay. um, right. and I was sitting around with a bunch of you know troops. Uh, I think I had about a hundred people on my flight because it was Air Force, and uh, my dad sent me that link. Oh, you're kidding me! And uh, he's like, "Check this out." <laughs> so I'm sitting around in the same reaction. Everybody else is like, "What is it? Ugh, what's happening? No, what is it? No, oh, no. You, every time you think it gets worse, it gets worse than that. Like, yeah, it's terrible. Oh well, I kind of forgot about that. Okay, right. and then I'm. I finally come up with this idea for the podcast and I listen to podcasts. So I like Joe Rogan. I like two bears, one cave. Now you kind of see where I, so that's Tom Segura and Burt Kreischer. Okay. And I basically stole their name. Uh, I like the same premise, two bears, one cave. They're two big, hairy comedians and they, (laughs) they're in their man cave talking. So I was like, all right, well, Typically, I, I planned on having a, another cop with me to to co-host all the time, but scheduling and the one guy that I had that was willing to do it lived too far away, so we just couldn't yeah. maintain it. But by that time, I already had the name. I was like, well, donuts are funny, two cops, one donut. And then I kind of had like this whole Simpsons idea theme because I love yeah. Chief Wiggum and the the way they portray cops on there. Right. That's and, awesome. Uh, so, yeah, that's how the name came up, but then – cops being cops um as it started to spread you know my buddies that i work with like, oh that's funny that's like two girls one cup i'm like fuck yeah yeah, yeah you're right it is like two girls one cup. That's, just, that's what i assumed it was <laughs> yeah so. yeah and i but you know unintentionally it worked in my favor because it gets attention and the cops you know especially in the cop world or first responder world we got a dark sense of humor as it is and they see the name and they're like i gotta check that out yeah. And then they either had two reactions. It's like, oh, this is good, or fuck, I ain't listening to a three hour long podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it's too long. But yeah. I want real conversations. And the most popular podcast in the world is Joe Rogan's, and his are three hours. So yeah, it man. just tells me as long as the content's good, people will listen. They don't have to li- The beauty of a sure. podcast, you don't have to listen to the whole thing, and you don't have to listen to the ones you don't want to. You just pick yeah. and choose. And if you like a certain guest or whatever it is, yeah, you've you got fast that forward if you want to, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I the shit. There's episodes I skip of Rogan's. There's episodes that I skip of Two Bears One Cave. There's some other ones I listen to, but yeah, yeah. now that I'm studying for Sarge, I don't listen to shit. Uh, Dude, I hear it. Um, well, see, you're asking me earlier, you know, how far I made it, and I knew that I didn't want to have fucking ten Chris Hoyers working for me, so that's why I never promoted, man. I, I knew better, so yeah, so, yeah. I'll just stay up three days back, I guess. So yep, good. I'm trying to promote. But um, I want to get you, you, you wrote the book and the, the title yep. of your book is, oh, this says it's under construction. 
Yeah, um, still, yeah. Yeah. Like fucked up on the place. So. so um your book is called uh When the Day Comes. Is that what it is? When that day comes, training for the fight. Okay, training for the fight. So we're actually, if you are listening, I'm on his uh, website that is currently being built. Um, it's called trainingforthefight.org, and that's all spelled out. Um, I've also got his Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. I think that is sort of a, maybe a podcast webpage. Um, but it's got some more information about Chris and his book. It actually looks like an audio of your book, maybe. Could be, yeah. Um, yeah. My my girl running the the website, she changes shit all the time, so I haven't been on there for a couple of days. So yeah, typical cop. You're just like me. I I have a website, yeah. but I'm very bad at updating it and stuff like that. I'm the worst. So. Um, but yeah, definitely check out the book. Go to trainingforthefight.org. Um, and people that may want you to come out and speak, uh, is that something they they just reach out to you? How how does Absolutely, that work? Yeah, um, you can throw my email on there and my phone number too if you like to. But I I literally just got back um, three days ago from New Hampshire. You know, San Diego to New Hampshire. Okay. Uh, and I oh, spoke to. There was actually several agencies, but it was, as groups go, it was kind of a smaller group of about thirty. Um, and I mean, it, it was great, man. I had a, had a blast, you know, and these, a lot of these smaller agencies, a lot of the, the protocols that we take advantage of and take credit for, if you will, they don't have, so they don't know about critical incident stress management and, um, you know, debriefings and contingency plans and emergency plans. And they, they hear it from the bigger city guys. And they're like, holy shit, that's a great idea. We need to do that ourselves, you know. And um, and I don't give a shit where you are. I don't care if you're working freaking Podunk, Maryland, or fucking Chicago. A critical incident is a critical incident, and it can happen anywhere, anytime. And it doesn't have to be a gunfight. It doesn't have to be some major thing. It can be, you know, like with me sometimes, you know, knowing that I had to put down three of my dogs in a year. That's that's a fucking problem for me. It could be something like that for you, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, we just got back from vacation, my wife and I, and we boarded our dogs for that, yeah. you know, week and a half. And uh, the whole time, I'm just sitting there thinking, like, they think I left them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm in my head. I'm like, they think I just abandoned them. And yeah. uh, I have big dogs. I got a Doberman and a German short hair. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but they, they went to a training boarding, you know, like where they were being trained, uh, by a guy that used to train, you know, police and military dogs and things like that. So, um, I was like, these are very much family dogs. I'm not looking to make a bite dog or anything like that. Um, but when it comes to working together, those two dogs, I can walk one dog, does everything I tell it to. I can walk the other dog, does everything I tell it to, but together (laughs) it's a nightmare. So I was like, I need, I need help. I'm pretty good at training dogs and basic obedience, but um, that imp- that one thing I, I I felt my anger growing, and I didn't want to take it out on the dogs. I was like, we need to we oh, need yeah. to get these guys some help. But um, well, is there anything I missed that you're like, okay, this is something else I think we should hit? Um, well, you can clearly see I can talk, so I think we pretty much hit on most of everything. So, um, right. the book itself is actually on. Uh, Audible as well. So if you're one of those guys that doesn't like to sit down with a book in your hand, that's this guy. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like old school. I like to have it in my hand so I can actually read it, you know, but yeah. it is available that way as well. Um, I got to throw a little plug out there since you said I could. Um, oh, absolutely. So I did the original version, um, came out in actually 2020. And if you can see behind me, um, that copy that you see on the wall there is the very first, um, what they call an author's copy. Uh, Cause what you, you send off to your publisher, they send you back an author's copy. You do your thing. You're like, yeah, it's good to go. And then they send you the real one. And so uh, fast forward, um, March of 2020 is when that one came out. Um, I actually sent a copy to the president and you can't see it from here, of course, but he actually sent me a handwritten note back. Um, and it was the greatest thing ever. Cause I'm like, get this, this fucking letter from the white house. And I'm like, the fuck is this? Sure enough, he ended up uh, writing out something for me. It was super neat, so I, I framed that, put it up on the wall. So, oh, very cool. Um, and then fast forward, um, 
because I'm that guy again, I'll say it. Um, I did the first version of the book or the first edition, if you will. And it dawned on me about six or eight months or so after I got it done that I never, I never wrote a story for the dispatch radio community. So my, and the, the dispatchers, man, they, they fucking save my skinny little ass like on a daily basis, you know? Yeah. And I completely freaking ignored them. I'm like, what? And I did, there was a few little things in, in the original one, but I went back and actually wrote a story. Um, I've got two other close friends that are also, uh, one still on Phoenix. One was um, another Arizona agency. She, she retired from there. Both have very compelling stories as well. And I added their stories to the second edition of the book and then wrote two more stories as well for an additional two more. Uh, the plug that I'm laboring to get to, my apologies, is um, I'm a huge Dave Grossman fan. And if you've ever seen Dave speak, he he's unbelievable. The guy. I know just, the name. I just can't figure out why. He, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, he was a, um, um, he was a ranger, uh, Vietnam vet, um, best-selling author. He wrote on killing on combat. Ah, yeah. Um, all yeah, those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fucking unbelievable guy, man. Just love that guy to death. Got a chance to see him for the very first time in 03. Um, and then actually got a chance to sit down and, and one-on-one talk to him in 2017. Um, I quoted a few things from him in my book before, before I ever had that meeting, I wrote all the stuff out. Um, and in fact, let me, uh, I'm going to spin this really quick just so you can see it. Um, so there's a, a one-off Dave Grossman poster right there. So what Dave does, he writes these things on the wall on this little this pad of paper thing that he's got and he throws it on the floor and I'm like, Oh shit, I got to grab one. So I had him sign it and do all this great shit, you know? And, uh, so I reached out to Dave in, uh, 2021 and um i said hey you know I'm, I'm trying to figure out do i have all my former bosses and stuff right like a little excerpt on the book or do i go straight to the top and have dave look at it and, and endorse it for me and uh about three days later he comes back he's like well i can't promise anything but you know i'll, I'll take a look at it and, uh, dude, you're, i mean the fact that you're responding to me at all is like it's, it's huge so uh I sent him a copy of the book and uh, about a week later he responds back and I don't have the email in front of me, but basically it was saying something to the effect of like, wow, you know, greatest law enforcement prep book he's ever read. And I'm like, I just wanted to see if you put your name on it. <laughs> Cause I know he does that for a lot of other authors and shit. Um, so he actually wrote a really nice long forward for me in the book. Uh, so his name is actually attached on the front of the front of the book itself now, which is very cool for me from a, what I call dumbass fucking street cop for 20 years. It's like, yeah, wait a second. You know, I, I survived my career. Um, actually wrote a book, which is still just kind of weird that I, that I accomplished that goal. And now I've got Dave Grossman basically putting his name on there for me. It's like, I, I don't know how much better I can get, you know, I yeah. mean, it's like the fucking greatest thing ever. So yeah, I, um, man, but I feel kind that, of man. the point of that whole thing too also is that I've got, um, I had six, I'm down to three. I think um, I've got three more Dave Grossman um, signatures on three of those, three of those last books. I gave away the other three or sold them, whatever. I don't remember what I have, but if you're a big Dave Grossman fan and you want to copy that, I got three left. Dude, that's legit. Yeah. He's awesome. I actually, (laughs) one of the books I'm reading right now, um, listening to, I don't read a whole lot, uh, is uh, I believe he's in there. Um, I, I think he's talking about leadership. Um, he's got several. Yeah, he's got a few. Um, yeah, I know he just did one not long ago with um, Adam Davis, who's another big freaking stud. Yeah, um, on spiritual combat. Um, yeah, and he's got uh, like bulletproof marriage, other books like that for obviously for yep. marital shit. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think <laughs> Simon Sinek is the name of the author that I'm listening to. It's part of my requirement for the sergeant's exam I'm taking. Um, but I'm pretty sure that he's quoted in there several times. Yeah, Yeah. because when you said lieutenant colonel, I was like, "Yeah, we just we just had a lieutenant colonel mentioned in this book, but I don't recall the name." So it probably was. Yeah, I'm gonna double check. Yeah, Yeah. but no, that's that's awesome, brother. Um, so yeah, so they can get your book on Audible. I already saw it on Amazon. I was when I was looking looking you up in the uh, five minutes of research I do with my guests before I talk to them because I'm still a dumb street cop too. I'm the same man. People are, I have people ask me all the time, man, how do you get all these guests and stuff? I'm like, 
I'm an idiot. I don't know. I just, I, t- <laughs> I talked to one other idiot who happens to know another idiot. And then, then we, right. we, yeah. and then we just, we filter to each other. It's how it goes. So, um, it's in your lap, man. Yeah. yeah. I had Randy Sutton on who does the, oh, um, yeah, like, fucking love Randy, like he's a good so. dude, you know, and huge in the law enforcement yeah. community. Um, oh, yeah. uh, Brandon's getting me connected with, uh, that cool ass sheriff over there, um, in Pinal County. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, Mark, things like, Mark's yeah. like, I'm like, I know that name. Why do I know that name? I'm like, is he the guy that pulls over the slow drivers and makes videos of him? And he's like, yep, <laughs> that's the dude. I was like, yeah. I love that guy. Yeah. So, he did that series. Uh, it was like 60 days in too. Um, yep. and his down there. So yeah. Pretty interesting. So, yeah, so it, like, I'm hopefully gonna get him on here. You know, I got. Oh, yeah, it's, I'll do it. I'll do it. it's funny. It's funny, like dumb guys like us, the stuff that we, we can get, accomplished just through the niche of the job. Oh, absolutely. And I tell you what, man, the the more you you pay it out and you pay it forward, the more it comes back on you. You know, yeah, I mean, it's like, for sure. Shit. I mean, I never in a million years would have expected myself to be sitting where I'm at now. Um, you know, doing these kinds of shows, and I'm like, oh yeah. shit, yeah, you know. I All mean, I ever knew was fucking chase bad guys, you know? Well, this is this is the top of your resume right now. You're on two cops, one donut. So. Yeah, exactly. There you go, man. Which, by the way, I guarantee if you uh, <laughs> if you find Dave Grossman, he will. He does a lot of podcasts as well. So. Oh, does he? Okay. Hell yeah. He, he's just the most fascinating guy to listen to, man. It's I had my girlfriend, Natalie, who did all the editing for my book, by the way. Uh, another plug there. Um, <laughs> she got a chance to see him for the first time. Uh, a few months ago in Phoenix and I had been talking to him all up because I just, I just think the guy's just a stud. And uh, I was looking over her and she was, her eyes were just glued to him. She was like, Oh my God, he's, he's such a powerful speaker, man. It's unbelievable. You're like, Holy shit, man. So just a really good dude. So, well, when we get off here, I'm probably going to look him up because I, I guarantee I've seen him or heard him or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just didn't realize it. I'm so bad with names too. Not a I good cop know. feature to have, but. <laughs> no I, worries, man. So. I, see I can face. remember license plates and shit, but I can't remember your fucking name, you know? <laughs> oh, I'm even worse with license plates. Yeah. I yeah. hope to God your license plate has some sort of acronym that I can make in my head right. real quick, you know, uh, <laughs> like DWC or whatever, because like yeah. DWC oh, yeah. to me means driving while cool. Yeah, That's how I remember it. I'm like, driving while cool, I just need to remember the last three numbers. Yeah. If it's a bunch of numbers, I'm screwed because I can't yeah, remember I got, numbers. I got so. a picture of something because I'll forget. I'm like, well, it's like a fucking... Yeah. yeah. It, so. that's the beauty of having a cell phone that's the best investigative tool I've, that's ever been invented oh yeah oh, i'm yeah. like uh oh, we have an accident report i gotta do here okay picture of the vin picture of the car picture of the plate picture of the license uh, their driver's license i'm done <laughs> i don't need to do I mean, anything man, else get it so <laughs> yep well all right brother i'm gonna let you uh do your thing for the rest of the day here um i really appreciate you being on and uh when this gets ready to air uh i will definitely let you know and you can add it to your website if you're if your lady puts it on there <laughs> i give you yeah, I, I hope she does yeah i hope she does so uh um, awesome. so i gotta say thanks you thank you for what you do still being out there and good luck with the sergeant's promotion there and all that shit if you ever need a reference yeah, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you, it, man. You have, you want to, so, um, and if I got any other any other folks that are interested in doing a podcast, if you want, I'll send them your way as well. Uh, okay, yeah, absolutely. That's got, that's, got that's how this thing time. survives. It's all networking. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. all right, brother, I appreciate it. Stick around right after I hit end here, and we'll uh, finish it later.